It's three years, can you believe it, since lockdowns here in the UK. Many other countries did things very differently, but the broad sweep of things was it made us appreciate some new ways of communicating with each other and new ways of shopping. And the markets took advantage in some interesting ways, ways that people didn't think they were going to develop. Talking about that now, in a little bit of history, as a lesson for us all, is uh, Chris Bailey from Financial Orbit. Chris, welcome. Hi there. It's a pleasure to have you in the studio. Three years on from when we locked down here, as I said, some other economies did things differently. Uh, but um, the market's down on those very early days of lockdowns, and we didn't really know where things were going to develop. Looking back at that as an investor, uh, you're an IG client, you have money that you invest yourself long only, and so you're very exposed to these markets. What was going through your mind uh, uh, in those dark days of March 2020. It was going to be what happens next. And of course, you've got to be greedy when others are fearful. And I always felt that that kind of Easter period of 2020 was the moment to be thinking, well, hang on, is there going to be a sort of a, an ultimate, an improvement here? Is something going to work through? And it gave me confidence that something was going to happen. The fear levels were so high that I was thinking that actually markets were going to factor so much in, could it really honestly get any worse? And obviously that was, in hindsight, the best time to buy back into markets. And we saw in the subsequent movement of markets in late 2020 and into 2021, that investors saw a fantastic return. Reality is always, you've got to be greedy when others are fearful, but also fearful when others are greedy. And the really fascinating part of the last three years is that we've seen both more than once. And that is the really interesting thing as investors in 2023, a time when we've got a new bout of volatility and uncertainty, you've got to always be thinking, what am I investing in and why am I investing? And this is why it fundamentally becomes much more than just discussion about geopolitics or pandemics or related. We're back down to the world of what are companies really doing and thinking and saying? Back down to the world, actually, that only I grew up in in previous decades. And as always, you learn from history much more than you can ever think. There were a couple of differences there. I'll, I'll go into those in just a minute. What I want to do is to bring up a, a S&P 500. Um, uh, we quite often refer to this as, as a market that we follow when uh, the big moves are, are undertaken. You can see on the far left-hand side of the chart here, these were the COVID lows. We went into lockdown. As I say, we, we hit those lows uh, down there at levels, what, 2200. Here we are now at uh, 39.99, to be precise just below the uh, the 4,000 level for the S&P 500. I don't want to go into so much of what's happening at the moment, but I do want to take a look at this point, as you said, when, when we saw this market's lift. And the point I want to make here is, is the fact that I'm knowing at that low point that central banks and governments, organisations were desperate to support the markets. Those that couldn't go into work were given money under the mm. furlough scheme. Companies were given support. Um, there was quantitative easing. There was money out there that previously wasn't available. So it was no surprise, was it, that markets were going to rise. But we didn't know that at the COVID lows. Absolutely. But it's the fact that what are governments going to do? What are central banks really going to do? They're going to say, we want a world which works. And the wonderful thing about a crisis is that it leads to people thinking, how do we solve this? You think about previous historic crises, issues in the 1970s re with re-oil, how that led to so many other changes. The dot-com crisis in the early part of this century, how that ultimately led to other evolutions too. Whenever you have a crisis, governments, central banks, other important companies and related people in the world try to figure out how to make an improvement here. And that's what it led to some new different companies, the Zooms of this world and related, coming back, companies we'd never even heard of, suddenly becoming relevant to our lives. But if you think about it, it accelerated changes that were inevitably going to happen. Was it that strange that ultimately we were going to do mm. a bit more homeworking or whether we were going to do even more stuff via technology, something online or related, using cloud systems or related? Not really that. It just accelerated it. And mm. it's the same really with global shifts and changes. So countries that became more relevant or more important in the world, it was already slowly happening. It just accelerated some of those movements. So as investors, I'll be honestly that surprised. The mechanisms could not be have been predicted, but the income and impact of them are things which actually I think smart investors can actually work out and see benefits and opportunities from. You mentioned the right word there, smart investors. Let's let's bring up Zoom, the, the, the poster child of, 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 of lockdown. This this is a fascinating chart. We were talking so much about this at the time, thousands of percent up from where it was uh, pre-COVID, up to the highs that we saw, uh, what, October 2020. Then came the slide. This is the problem, isn't it, about um, investing in the market? It's time, timing mm. and getting uh, anticipating what's going to happen. It doesn't matter how smart you are. I guess the point is you're going to 
to miss some of these at some point along the way. Um, but Zoom was an interesting one. Um, and let's bring up another one. Uh, Amazon, we all started shopping online. Of course, uh, this benefited Ocado, it benefited the Sainsbury's online business or whatever. But the Amazon uh, shape is a little bit different as much as it stayed high for a little, a little bit longer uh, than Zoom communications. Um, uh, again, thinking back to the, the, the mindset that we were given at the time, uh, to be able to anticipate this and take part in that rally, you didn't know how high it was going to go. But my guess is that when it was at the highs, these companies were massively overvalued, weren't they? Absolutely. But that happens every time we have a big shift in the markets. It happened at the dot-com boom. It happened in the issues in the 1970s, real oil, oil and gas. Something mm -hmm. which seemed yep. amazing and required at the time became overloved and then hence ho overhyped. Reality is Zoom is a brilliant system, very helpful, very useful, but not something which we're going to pay a huge amount of money for. Ditto Amazon, whilst we all will be doing more stuff and have done more stuff over the last 10 years online, cloud is really the key for the Amazon business. Yeah. But even in cloud, the, real, the only part of the business that makes money at the moment, there are other companies that can operate cloud um, uh, angles out there. And the opportunity for Amazon to charge a huge amount of money for it is unfortunately moving away. Competition, you know, high prices and high profits lead to more competitors and more at different angles out there. So inevitably, the thing with investment is you get that immediate reaction, that enthusiastic aspect, people looking forward and saying, wow, sentiment is exciting in these areas, we've got to invest in it. But then actually the fundamental, quieter, slower investor starts thinking, as you say, too much is now priced in. We've gone from extreme fear to extreme greed. Mm. And as discussed, you've got to be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. Mm. And what we saw really in as 2021 moved into 2022, areas which seemed very exciting and, oh my goodness, we must be invested there, suddenly became overly loved and hence too expensive. And you've mentioned some of the prime examples of that, the Zooms, the Amazons, the Ocados, my goodness, great businesses, valid businesses, but not businesses which you can always say are cheap. And I would say still, judging even by the share price movements of recent times, you still need to try and justify whether a company is honestly mm. cheap or not. Mm. And that is something for the fundamental investors mm. to work out. So as always, the world of investment is you move between sentiment and fundamentals. And as those shifts occur and, sh and move around, they give you your buying and selling opportunities. This is why investment is always an active investing game. I know people love to believe that you can just put your money into something, close your eyes, and it works. It doesn't work like that. Things get anticipated, appraised, fully excited about, or not, not are loved at the moment. And as we see at the moment, we've got areas that are not perceived in, in a good form. They're not loved, they're not, um, that people don't perceive that they're exciting. But actually they may be some of the more exciting investment zones for us. That is the wonderful world of investments. Opportunities come just when you're not really looking for it. Mm. Let me just quickly wrap a couple of other companies we were talking about. Don't necessarily have to talk about these particularly. I want to bring up a couple more charts for Can. Boohoo Group is an interesting one. It's an aim-listed company. Of course, these small companies, when they when they attract a lot of interest, they, they do tend to fall off quite quickly if there's no sort of uh, long-term interest in the business, such as one chart. The other one I do want to talk about though is Peloton. Peloton I find fascinating because this is one of these everybody had to, well, felt they wanted to keep up their exercise levels, of course, during lockdown. So the obvious thing to do was to buy into a system which Peloton um, uh, gave us. But we're now in the situation where I suppose they were too successful too quickly to follow through with any sort of rational long-term strategy. And now I'm hearing questions about the long-term chances of survival of the company like this, which I find amazing when you consider that we are, and indeed have been before lockdown, something where we desperately trying to make sure we were fit on top of things, going to gyms and everything. This was our ideal answer and remains in my book, but it's doing so badly. Indeed, because ultimately any successful company over the medium term has to have a good balance sheet. Mm. And the problem with the Pelotons, to some extent even the boohoos of this world, is that a good idea which worked well and got loved up for general investment allocation, people thought it was a winning area. But the trouble is people fail to look at, does it not only have a good and attractive medium term valuation, but does it also have a balance sheet which makes sense or it's not going to worry people and as companies uh, evolve and change they've got to have a balance sheet which allows them to do that and the trouble is as more competitors come in as more challenges occur suddenly if you don't have a good balance sheet and a good underlying business you're going to struggle you're not going to be or you're not going to be able to justify those sort of high investment valuations which you had previously. And there's mm. two examples there. Companies I would imagine will continue, but they've probably got to continue with radical changes to the way that they were managed five, eight years ago. 
that's just the way business shifts in the world, I'm afraid. Mm. This is why I, I always, we go back to the important aspect for any ongoing investor, the quarterly results season. I know it yeah. sounds terribly yeah. boring, but it's terribly important. Mm. Yeah, we've spoken quite often about this and, and the way things move. I um, just want to quickly wrap this up with one final question. I want to bring up the S&P 500 again, because I think in the context of these COVID lows um, and in the current crisis, which I didn't really want to talk about too deeply about, but we are in possibly uh, a very uh, fragile part of the cycle. Do you think that the authorities are going to have to get back in like they did during COVID to try and support these markets? Do you think the COVID lows you can see here on the chart on the left hand side there, do you think they're going to be achieved? Uh, what's the mindset and what should be our mindset as an investor or a trader at the moment? You can't always be bailed out by governments or central banks. And if central banks and governments are smart, they've got plenty of other challenges to deal with, not just inflation or underlying growth or aging populations or whatever. You can't always bail people out. And so ultimately, we've got to say, um, you've got to have a fundamental underlying rationale there for why a company has to continue to be important and useful. The better news for all investors is that the world still remains a place which is improving. And I know that doesn't sound possible for investors at the moment, but believe me, when I look at the broader global world out there, it is still getting richer and smarter. It may not exclusively be in the Western world, it may be in other parts yeah. of the world, but it's still occurring out there. And that is why when I look at the typical FTSE 100 company, many S&P 500 companies, many other companies in key European markets, they are inherently global nowadays. Mm -hmm. And that's the correct way to think about life. Nice positive end to an interview. Uh, Chris, it's been a pleasure. Thanks indeed Thank for joining us. Uh, with a look back there, the uh, last three years uh, and of course uh, that anniversary of the first lockdowns for COVID-19.